everybody. Today I'm driving an Aston Martin V12 Vantage. Why? Because I can. But also to ask a very specific question. I recently looked at an original V12 Vantage and subsequently a V12 Vantage S. And now I'm back re-examining the first generation car for a couple of reasons. Number one, its lovely owner Andrew offered me a go. And um, I'll never turn down a chance to drive a V12 Aston Martin or quite frankly, any Aston Martin. Secondly, this is a chance for me to rectify some of the mistakes that I made in my first video and get to enjoy this car on roads that I know well. It's also an opportunity to explore a question, a question that this car's owner has, which is, what would you do with a car like this? Now, as you might be able to see, this isn't an entirely standard V12 Vantage. Mechanically, it is unchanged, save for a decat, or secondary decat anyway, and a Quicksilver back box. So there's no fancy power kit or anything on the engine. This produces the standard 510 horses. The suspension equally is completely standard, as is this six-speed manual gearbox, which I have to say is very nice to use, and I don't think Aston Martin should have ever gone away from. Later cars all used a seven-speed dogleg manual, which everyone thought was a good idea, but those that I know who've driven one aren't exactly in love with. The reason for that may be because it's actually a reverse engineering of a gearbox which was never designed to actually be a manual. It's essentially an automated manual transmission with all the hydraulic automated bits taken off. So as a super quick recap, what's the V12 Vantage like? Well, it's a deeply flawed car. I mean, you think, you take one of Aston Martin's greatest ever cars, the V8 Vantage, and you stuff in their biggest engine, it should be an instant hit. And indeed it was, but I think it's a car that they really didn't get quite right first time round. The biggest failing is in the suspension. It's far too stiff. I have, since I drove one of these last, had a go in the V12S. That video should already be out. And that car has a much improved suspension setup. As you can probably tell, this car is also wearing some fairly aggressive Aston Martin AMR Aero. In fact, this car has on it pretty much every piece of carbon that you could buy from Aston. And it wasn't cheap. You've got carbon splitter, you've got carbon dive planes, a very funky looking carbon wing at the back, which I'd like to know whether people like or not. Carbon bits at the rear, you've got carbon ski slope in here, you've got carbon gear surround, you have even these carbon struts in the back. It's a pretty amazing thing. And it sounds awesome. Absolutely epic. It does not have the ridiculous low end pull or punch of the power kitted S that I drove, but in isolation, this is still a very decent engine. It pulls well, and if the early V8 in particular is your frame of reference, this certainly is a quick car. But the reason for the question that I have to ask is that in its current setup, it really is a jack of all trades and truly master of none because it is a bit too stiff, I think, to really enjoy on big, long journeys. Equally, it's perhaps a little too cushy and uh, loud to enjoy on track days. And its owner enjoys both of those things. And he wants to know which direction he should go down. And so by the end of this video, I'm hoping to have really worked out what I would do if this were my car. It being an Aston, of course, my initial thoughts would be, oh, well, obviously, nice GT car. Put a softer suspension on it, and you're pretty much done. You can enjoy it, it's great. To turn it into a track car is gonna be a little bit more involved because first thing I wanna do is change these seats for some buckets. Then, of course, you have to change the exhaust, and that's very sad because it means you won't get to hear that V12 quite as clearly. But it's necessary if you want to be able to enjoy this car on track days here in the UK. I'll tell you something, everywhere I look, there is a new piece of carbon to find in this car. You've got the wing mirrors, you've got the door handle surrounds. It's crazy. 
I'm sure there are plenty of people that would love this car just as it is, but that suspension is just needlessly punishing. I don't know why they decided to sign it off this way, but hey ho. There's a couple of other nice things this car's owner has done. The main one for me is the fitment of an updated Android Auto compatible head unit here, which is great and much needed because, well, these early cars, the head unit was pretty out of date even when they were new, so that certainly makes it a much more usable thing. For track use, that carbon, I think, does present a problem because it is going to get absolutely and completely battered. Even if you PPF all of it, the amount of stones and things that are going to be thrown at the car, that's to say nothing of if you have an off, are just going to ruin everything. And it's, um, it's not cheap to replace that stuff. If you see race cars with carbon on, you'll notice how it's always a little bit rough around the edges, not very fancy to look at because they know that it's going to get damaged and eventually thrown in the bin, so there's no point making it look all neat and tidy. But as a GT car, what then is the point of all of this fancy aero? You know, the owner's currently in two minds as to whether he likes the wing. I don't like the wheels that are fitted to this car. I, I don't like the styling and they look like, and I have had it confirmed, they are an absolute nightmare to clean. Total nightmare. This car also has carbon brakes. Again, they're great, they work well, they're probably decent on track, but if you burn through those, that's going to be really expensive. I suppose the way you could look at this car is as a cheaper alternative to a, a GT12, the limited edition fancy car that Aston Martin made, which costs an awful lot of money. slides a lot. Last time I drove one of these it wasn't on roads that I knew and there was quite a bit of traffic so I didn't have the opportunity to really play with it but my life this thing wriggles. For this kind of road the power is plenty. The pedal placement actually isn't that great for heel and toe either. The biggest wrong that needed writing from my first video was the fact I don't think I actually properly gave an answer to the question that I asked in the title which was did I make the right decision by buying my Ferrari 550 instead of the V12 Vantage? The answer is yes, I absolutely did. I love the Ferrari to pieces, it's brought me an awful lot of opportunities. I'm now doing some really exciting stuff with it and I haven't yet seen another 550 on the roads whereas I've seen a lot of Vantages. The 550 is also much more of a proper GT car. It really is a perfect vehicle to do a lot of miles in. In fact, I've even come to film this review today in it, so I've put 200 miles on the car in a day, and they've been extremely enjoyable. The steering in these is excellent, it really is, but just not quite as good as in the V8. It's just a, a little bit of texture and feel has been robbed and you can tell that it's obviously having to work that front end hard because there is a lot more weight up there. And that does present another problem because, you know, okay, for a track car, it means the weight distribution is going to be all a bit funky and, and weird. And so, I think really, with this car, what I would do, I'd turn it into a fast road car. I would go for a softer suspension setup, and frankly, that which Aston fitted to the V12S is spot on. You need nothing else. This gearbox is brilliant, and honestly, the engine, for the most part, is plenty adequate. Sounds great, I mean, really great. It's an Aston V12, of course it does, but it does sound genuinely brilliant. I'd also probably lose the rear wing entirely. The, the rest of it, I haven't got an issue with, but the rear wing is just an oddity, as far as I'm concerned. It's just strange and it winds up blocking a lot of your rear view too, so to make this into a track car I think you'd have to almost butcher it, and it seems a bit too nice to do that too. I would one day love to build a track car out of an Aston Martin, but I think probably the best place to start is going to be with a pretty cheap 4.3 V8, you know, 
get one that's cosmetically a bit poor, strip it out, and go and have an enormous amount of fun pretending to be a gentleman racer. I think that's the way to do it. Anyway, there you go. There's a short little video from me with yet another Aston Martin. Always a good day, I think. I hope you agree. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.